Welcome once again to The Breakfast here on PLOS TV Africa. And now to uh, a little bit of history. I'm going back to 2005, actually. Uh, this week we've spoken, you know, a little bit about uh, international collaborations, uh, mm -hmm. foreign interests and some of all of that. And that, you know, includes the Afghanistan uh, issues. Um, and I made mention, you know, of the, the you know, parts, we, you know, where Russia and China may also, um, you know, be involved politically, you know, that we may not understand entirely yet. And if you remember also when the crisis in Syria was at its peak, uh, when there were also militants trying to take over uh, the uh, government uh, of, uh, Al um, of Assad uh, back then, there was, um, you, could, you could tell that there were interests between two different countries, the United States and Russia. They both had different interests on the same issue. Russia was, of course, supporting Assad. Uh, the United States, you know, you know, used every single bit of its, you know, media to try to paint a particular story you know, and said Assad was bombing his, you know, his people with biological weapons and some of all of that. But of course, his politics is war, you know. Um, so on this day, um, in 2005, there was the first ever joint military exercise between Russia and China. Uh, they somehow, some way, have always had, you know, pretty much similar uh, interests politically and, of course, um, um, in, you know, maybe economically also. Uh, it was called the Peace Mission, and it was in 2005. It began on this day. The exercise started um, on the 19th of August and consisted of a combined land, sea, and air elements simulating an intervention in a state besieged by terrorist or political turmoil. Uh, the force practiced air and naval blockades and um, amphibious assault and occupying a region. Approximately 8,000 Chinese troops took uh, part, along with 2,000 uh, Russian troops. But listen, the United States was not invited to observe the exercise. <laughs> they stated the reason is for, uh, the, ex the reason stated was that the um, exercise was for counterterrorism, yeah. and so they were not invited. Um, it was just Russia and China. So, so, that, so that, that's why, you know, I started with the Assad mm -hmm. uh, narrative, you know, because of the roles that they played. And if you, if you see a lot of times, there's always some interest. In the United States and South Korea, you know, would always, you know, be brothers, you know, in, in uh, war. Uh, same with France and the UK, um, all, you know, in the same space. But sometimes you would always see that uh, Vladimir Putin always has a totally different perspective with um, re regards war politics. Yeah, this was interesting. The war games of 2005, it was a military operation that lasted eight days. We know, first of all, that China and Russia have, you know, some of the, actually the top two, or they are among the top three, you know, largest, you know, military in the world. So they did this um, uh, military drills for eight days, basically simulating an imaginary country yeah. that was under a terrorist attack and what exactly they would do. China and Russia brought their armed forces together to do those drills. And I think that's great. So, you know, maybe the key to, uh, you know, solving our own security threats is, you know, international collaboration with, you know, other um, armed forces of other countries. Who knows, you know? No, it's not. It's, it's, it's being able to, it's been to deal with your issues by yourself. And Afghanistan is a perfect example of why you should be able to sort out your, your own horses. issues by yourself. <laughs> I mean, it's pretty simple. You know, I, I listened to... Um, uh, the Daily yesterday, I think it's um, the, the podcast um, mm -hmm. yesterday. And so there was a build-up to this. There's a particular reporter who has been, um, she's from Afghanistan, but she's reported for the Washington, Washington Post for a couple of years. Um, so there was a daily countdown just before they eventually um, uh, uh, took Kabul. She was, you know, sharing, you know, voice notes with the Washington Post, um, trying to get out, you know, of Afghanistan till, you know, yesterday when uh, the podcast was put out she still was still you know in afghanistan and her life is in danger yeah lots of reporters point, are trapped in there yeah but the point is you know one of the things that was mentioned you know one of the people that i interviewed she stated how much corruption um you know is a key factor in why afghanistan fell um and how um ghani and his and his government and every other person who has been in, in there in the last 20 years has really just been stealing you know from afghanistan and not doing anything to actually boost the army or make the army better or make their defense better so um the U.S. will only help you for as long as it can, you know, and of course benefit for as much as it can. But if you can't help yourself, then you're on your own, mm. absolutely on your own. Okay, let's go to 2003, where on this day, a car bomb actually attacked the United Nations headquarters, and that was in Iraq, and it killed the agency's top envoys and about 21 other employees. It was a very sad day in history, and it wasn't the first time we've seen attacks on humanitarian agencies, aid workers, people who, you know, volunteer their time, 
you know, to go help out countries like Iraq, even Nigeria, where there are humanitarian crises, and then they end up becoming victims of the situation they stepped in to resolve. So it was a uh, car bomb at the Canal Hotel um, in Baghdad in Iraq. It killed 22 people, including that United Nations Special Representative, um, Sergio Veria de Mello, wounded over 100 people, including a human rights lawyer. Um, that blast targeted the United Nations assistance mission in Iraq, which was created just five days earlier. Um, after that bombing, um, about um, 600 UN staff were withdrawn from Iraq. And it, it had this ripple effect across humanitarian services across the world. It's weird how, you know, this happened, you know, uh, two years after 9-11. Um, in 2001, and at this time, the United States was already in Iraq, uh, carrying out their own war to try to, you know, defeat the, you know, Al Qaeda and, and uh, the Taliban and, you know, Osama bin Laden. Um, um, there was still, of course, you know, the the, you know, influence and the effect of these terrorist groups at that time. Um, Iraq has not really been in the news lately for some of all these things, but it's just really, really sad mm -hmm. how lives need to be lost every now and then. Yeah, terrible. And it just casts my mind back to um, two years ago when we saw the killing of aid workers here in Nigeria, you know, um, staff of the Red Cross abducted and killed. You know, it's, it's, it's terrible that these continues to happen. And just a weird situation where you also consider what's happening in Ethiopia, the Tigray region, how, you know, humanitarian workers become victims of, the, of, of circumstances, you know, but that's what happened in this same history in 2005. We'll take a break here, and when we come back, we'll be talking about the situation in Zamfara State, where um, kidnapped students of the College of Agriculture in Zamfara, um, we've seen them surface in a video where they're pleading um, to the federal government to make sure that they are released, and also communicating the wishes of these bandits for a ransom of about 350 million naira. Stay with us.